So probably the best way to start today's lecture will be the big sneeze. Maybe that would be the appropriate way to start. Uh, so <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about coronaviruses, which are not up here because their structure is really actually kind of boring. Uh, but uh, first we need to revisit a little bit our viruses from last time. So our first clicker question of the day is, the fastest currently selling drug targets, oh, first, sorry, fastly, fastest currently selling drug, too many things in here, targets polio 3C, the yellow fever virus protease, hepatitis C's replicase, West Nile virus's E protein, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Quick, quick, 20 seconds left, go. <laughs> 10. Okay, what do we think? Yay. Yes, it is the hepatitis C's replicase or the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, how well it works, whether it's worth $1,000 a dose, probably open to question. Um, what's 3C in polio? Just a quick review. Protease. The protease, exactly. And yellow fever, protease. Um, these are certainly targets, and particularly the protease of hepatitis C is a big target for probably the second fastest selling drug um, for using this. And protease inhibitors are really good antivirals. Um, and if you think about polio, it's also that very last step of polio maturation, which is dependent on a protease. So proteases are really, really important in terms of virus replication. So that's why these anti-protease drugs are actually really quite successful. Um, West Nile virus's E protein, what's that one? So that's on the outside of the cell. It's the envelope protein. That's what's going to be involved in binding to receptors. And, okay, we still don't know exactly what a lot of these receptors are, but that's also a really great potential drug target because that's that interaction between the virus, or I should say the virion, and the host cell. And dengue, we desperately need some decent antivirals for dengue, which we don't have yet, but similar kinds of things. You know, people are looking at proteases, they're looking at the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in terms of trying to address some of these things. So, our next question. The organization of the yellow fever virus genome is most similar to the blank virus genome, where blank would be polio, MS2, 5.174, lambda, or T7. 
guess we have 47 people here, probably. Yes. Uh oh. Oh my goodness. I think this might be the first time, actually, that we have 100%. And better yet, all of them getting the right answer. Yay. Uh, now, <clears throat> that being said, uh, what about MS2? So, why wouldn't it be MS2? Yeah, one thing is a polyprotein. And that's actually probably the, the main reason. Otherwise, it's a single-stranded, positive RNA virus genome. Yeah? It just has four, yes, but it's not just the one. And so that's actually a nice introduction to today's stuff. And of course, these guys are all um, DNA viruses with very different kinds of genomes. What's FIX-174? Cool thing about that genome? Lots of overlapping open reading frames. Certainly true to some extent for MS2. Um, Lambda, just the different segments, uh, regulatory versus, and then T7, just those bits and pieces that come in individually into the virus genome. So uh, we can hide these ones, and hopefully everyone's going to get 100% on the next one, right? Sure. Yes? Good. Okay. Let's give it a try. Um, <clears throat> which of the following is R0 carried by mosquitoes? Yellow fever, dengue, West Nile, hepatitis C, all of the above. Ten. Yay. You did it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, that, some of you may have been wondering why I'm giggling up here. Um, and that is I can see your scores as they're coming in. And it bounced around a bit. It wasn't always 100%. So I know that a couple of you at least second guessed. Or you're trying to make it amusing for me. That's another possibility. <laughs> um, not quite sure which of these uh, you think was the case. But yes, it's hepatitis C, which does not appear to be carried by mosquitoes. All of the other ones are um, clearly carried by mosquitoes. And so that's um, get the whole idea here of vector-borne disease. And so <clears throat> that's the message as far as these uh, viruses are concerned. So that being said, anyone who needs to take off, adios, hasta la vista. Um, and <clears throat> I wanted to give people a chance to ask any questions about these flaviviruses that we haven't already gone over um, with this review so far. Uh, again, as far as molecularly, I really like to think of these as enveloped picoRNA viruses. Um, that's the really big difference as far as that's concerned. And then, of course, the disease aspects of things. So there are questions about the flaviviruses at this point. Yeah? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so sorry to, to paraphrase your question here, I'm sorry really for people who have taken off. Um, the question is, certainly dengue hemorrhagic fever, it's much more likely if you have two simultaneous infections. And the question really is, what if you had a previous infection and then get infected later on? Depends a lot on your immune response and what the immune response is to the first infection and how it responds. As we mentioned before, it seems to be this antibody-mediated um, endocytosis, so more antibodies will get more uptake. So if you have a really strong antibody response to the second infection, potentially that's going to make it a little bit higher. But I don't know all the details on exactly the percentages. Um, I'm sure if you go to the CDC website, they would um, give you some more information on that. But I unfortunately don't know exactly the details. But I would guess, again, from what I know with the antibodies, so if you have a really strong antibody response the second time around, but it's still a different virus, one of the different four, then potentially you could also have a higher risk of dengue hemorrhagic fever. Other questions on these viruses? Yeah. Um, with the hepatitis, is there a <coughs> that groups all the hepatitis viruses together besides just attacking the liver? Or yeah, so again, the question is um, various different hepatitis viruses. We've already talked about A and C now. Um, what about other hepatitis viruses? Is there anything that connects them together other than disease? And the answer is no. It basically seems to be the only thing is disease, which does make it kind of confusing because if you think about, okay, hepatitis A virus, what, okay, which, what was that? That was one of those, um, which one was it? Hepatitis A? Yeah, it's a picoRNA virus. So um, hepatitis B, we're going to talk about way towards the end. Um, that's actually kind of a retrovirus-like replication system. Totally cool virus. Um, not good disease-wise. Uh, and hepatitis C, now these um, flaviviruses. So, yeah, lots of different things. Turns out that there's um, a coronavirus, which is a hepatitis virus that we're going to talk about today. So, um, yeah, liver just seems to be a weight place that a lot of these things can replicate and cause disease. So, no, unfortunately... That's not a really good classification process, at least not at a molecular level. Other questions? Okay, so let's um, talk about coronaviruses. These are absolutely fascinating at a molecular level. Basically, almost nobody cared about them until about 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and the reason that they're so interesting from a molecular level is they're humongous single-stranded RNA viruses. And in fact, way beyond what people thought was possible in terms of the size of uh, RNA-only genome and being able to get away with it. These are 20 to 30 kilobases in length. So it's really pretty amazing. And we'll talk about how the virus has evolved to deal with this really large genome. Certain amount of common cold, people argue a lot about this. Is it you know, 5%, 10%, 30%? I think it depends on what virus you happen to work with and how you're trying to get money. Um, so, but <clears throat> that being said, again, most people didn't really care much about these other than the fact that they had these really humongous genomes until, of course, SARS came along and more recently MERS that we'll talk about um, a little bit more towards the end of, end of class today. A um, couple of key concepts, and all of this was basically discovered, at least this is on the left-hand side here, um, all of this was discovered again when the you know, few crazy people who are interested in coronaviruses were working with them, uh, having to do with protease receptors. And so we haven't talked about these as being particular, particular receptor molecules yet. Uh, it's probably quite interesting for how the virus gets inside the cell, if you think about it from the point of view of the metastable state of a capsid. It has to be really strong on the outside, but weak once it gets on the inside. So having a protease receptor kind of makes sense there. One thing we haven't talked about before is frame shifting, and that's moving from one open reading frame to another open reading frame in the same genome while you're translating it at the same time. And so this is the first time we'll talk about this. We'll also talk about this much more when we talk about the retroviruses later on in the class. The thing which is probably the most important in terms of these coronavirus genomes that, again, is very different than anything we've talked about so far is a whole concept of subgenomic RNAs. And this is how apparently the virus has evolved to deal with having this ridiculously large genome. 
And then we'll talk about reservoir species as well. This is where most of the viruses are hanging out most of the time. And this, of course, became very important in terms of thinking about SARS and MERS and all of these emerging diseases. Again, coronaviruses, I'm just thinking when I'm putting these lectures together, I always used to have origin, structure, et cetera. I should have origin slash disease because the more that I talk about these things, the more we get waylaid into talking about disease. A uh, little bit about the structure is, again, I mentioned before, it's a pretty boring structure except for the crown of all of these membrane proteins that are sticking out around the outside, which is, of course, where the coronavirus comes from originally. Binding and entry, we kind of talked about already. This has to do with the protease receptors. Um, really important here is replication, and most importantly, the messenger RNA production, because this is what's really different in terms of these coronaviruses. Translation is pretty straightforward, with the exception of that frame shifting taking place. And then release, as it turns out, it's actually really similar to what's happening with the flaviviruses that we talked about last time. Coronaviruses, you know, a whole bunch of different classes of them. They're in humans, they're in pigs, there's in dogs, there's in cats. Uh, but you know, nobody really cared again until SARS um, coronavirus came along. Um, and then many of these other ones. And this is getting back to your question about hepatitis viruses. So here's the mouse hepatitis virus um, here one of the best model systems for working with coronaviruses. A lot of the work, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today really comes from the work on this murine hepatitis virus because it's much better behaved than, than most of the other ones. But of course, this is what you know, everybody has uh, gotten interested in, spread all over the media, um, you name it, et cetera. Uh, huge <clears throat> output, and we'll talk about how relevant that really is um, a little bit later on. Um, hopefully you remember some of the numbers in terms of dengue um, and hepatitis C before. So coronavirus disease, most of these are animal viruses. Uh, of course, you know, we know of them in some cases, these common colds. Again, murine hepatitis virus is really the model system for understanding these coronaviruses. Almost all of the molecular aspects until SARS came along, um, were done on the murine hepatitis virus. SARS um, is really, I think, a great public health story because the disease came along in February and they found the virus and had it sequenced about four months later, which is really pretty amazing. And I think really speaks to public health kind of getting their act together. Uh, in terms of thinking about some of these things and a lot of the progress we've made in, in molecular virology. So first reported in February, a little over 1,300 cases in March, and then they had the virus and the genome was actually um, sequenced very, very soon thereafter. So literally just a couple of months. And if you think about previous viral diseases, <clears throat> um, way, way back um, in terms of that. So let's look a little bit more at SARS. Um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, that's what it stands for. Basic problem is that people suffocate. And that's why <clears throat> it causes uh, nasty disease. About 10% in terms of the fatality rate for people who've been infected. Um, zero deaths in the US, but still nonetheless cover of Time, Newsweek, US News and World Report, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> how many hepatitis C deaths per year in the US, approximately? Yeah, tens of thousands probably, certainly thousands. And you know, we're not making a big deal about hepatitis, are we? When we talk about influenza, any ideas? About 30,000 a year in the US from influenza. So yeah, this is, is pretty minimal. That being the case, it's a new emerging disease. So everybody gets scared about it. Uh, how do you get the disease? Um, seems to be direct contact. Actually, SARS is relatively hard to get infected by. And then the MERS virus we'll talk about at the end here is extremely hard to catch. And one of the main coronavirus researchers said it's a wimpy virus um, because it's actually really hard to <clears throat> be infected by it. So it's pretty much direct content, contact. 
and aerosols, these you know, little droplets that, again, sneezing would have been an appropriate thing here. And one of the things I like to say about aerosols is that it's about a meter away from you that uh, aerosols can get before they um, crash out. That means everyone sitting next to you is within range. Um, so uh, you can think about that next time. Uh, but again, this um, number of cases, uh, again, Around the, around on the order of 8,000. Um, what's pretty amazing is that there's been almost one scientific publication for each two cases of coronavirus, which are out there. Um, so, and that's literally on SARS um, in terms of what's been cited there. And um, just a little bit of an idea here, um, up to about 2002, you had about 120 citations a year. In 2003, you're up to 620. So about five times increase in numbers of publications. It actually stayed relatively high there, um, but it's not a problem. It's completely gone. Now, whether it'll come back, we have no idea. But um, yeah, last update was in 2004 and 2005, so almost 10 years ago. It was really very much sort of a flash in a pan um, kind of disease here. But people are worried about it potentially coming back. So the big question comes up, well, where did SARS come from? So a lot of this is going back here a little bit. Um, civet cats, this was the original thought um, that it was civet cats that were passing the disease on to humans. That seems extremely unlikely. And when Dr. Waitis comes and gives his guest talk, he can tell you a little bit more about that. But these guys were infected in the live animal markets in China, which is where the disease first arose. Um, but there's very few of those out in the wild. On the other hand, bats are completely loaded with coronaviruses. There are massive numbers of, of coronaviruses. And just as one example, these are from a couple of papers I pulled up from the CDC. 50% uh, of bats in the Philippines are positive for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase for coronaviruses. Uh, apparently, no disease whatsoever, although you know, sneezing bats, I'm not sure how easy it is to follow along with those. But it seems to make no difference. And people have done some really nice studies looking at virus-positive and virus-negative organisms. And that would be bats, you know, lots of things. And again, Dr. Radis will talk about this too. Uh, seem to be no symptoms whatsoever. There's no difference, um, positive or negative, in terms of longevity etc. And in some cases, in fact, they may be better off when they're infected. I'll leave that, leave that to him to give you the data on that. Um, bats in the U.S. also have coronaviruses. They're not quite as similar to the coronaviruses which are causing SARS, but um, that's still, again, clearly there's a big coronaviral reservoir um, in the U.S. And when I say reservoir, that means that's probably where the virus is being maintained in the environment. Because if you don't have any kind of symptoms, you know, it's not a problem. And then if you think about where bats like to live, like to hang out, sorry for that. <laughs> um, they're generally very close to each other. And so any kind of respiratory disease can be passed along um, very easily from one to the other. And so this is an example, in fact, from that first paper that I cited there. If you look at all of these coronavirus sequences, about 90% on here are going to be bat coronaviruses. Um, here, of course, in our nice little red box is our SARS coronavirus and then the civet cat coronavirus sequence, which is extremely similar, which is why people thought that that was where the virus had come from. The problem is if you go out into the rest of the environment, very few of these civet cats are in fact infected, whereas bats as you can see, have you know, massive numbers here. And some of them are very similar in terms of their sequence. And so we've looked at some of these trees before, but it bears going over again. The horizontal distance here between different sequences or different names here is proportional to the number of sequence differences that you have. So if you have a vertical line here, like between these two, the SARS and human, SARS and civet cat, that means that these two sequences are identical to each other. Here, there's a slight difference because you've got this you know, horizontal line here between the bat virus. And then 
further back you go, this is going to be more and more differences. The numbers that you have at each of these splittings of your tree, those tell you the statistical confidence that you have in the relationship between these two. And the 100%, that's you know, pretty darn confident, and that is that these guys are all in the same group. On the other hand, 37% up here, yeah, okay, 37% of the time, this bat coronavirus looks like those, but 63% of the time, it relates to something else. And so there's clearly a lot of other virus sequences that we don't have yet, um, given all of this diversity, because you see lots of long horizontal lines here, and again, most of them in bats. Now, why are you getting this massive degree of sequence change? It may well have to do with the fact that we've got these really big RNA virus genomes. And RNA viruses, certainly RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, don't have proofreading activity. So they can only get to a certain length before they start to make mistakes or not incorporate things. So it's potentially that's why you have so many of these different sequences here. So if you look at the viruses, again, pretty boring as far as I'm concerned. Uh, just look at a negative SANE TM image. Um, by boring, basically what I mean is it's hard to get a higher resolution structure of these viruses because they're so pleomorphic, and that is to say that they've got lots of different structures. So you know, this is a virion, that's a virion, this is a virion. All of these are different virions, but you can see they all have very different shapes. Um, the one thing which makes them similar to each other are these crowns of the envelope proteins um, on the outside. If you purify nucleocapsid from the inside of these envelopes, it's helical, and so this is really quite different than the positive strand RNA viruses we've talked about so far. Probably has to do with the length of the genome. This is a little bit easier to package in a helical form, and we'll talk about a lot of helical nucleocapsids when we talk about the negative strand RNA viruses later this week and next week. A um, few of them have icosahedral nucleocapsids, but again, for the most part, these are going to be helical. It's easy to look at this in a cartoon form. Here is our nice symmetrical coronavirus, but again, most of them aren't this way. With our helical nucleocapsid on the inside, the crown part of this are the spike proteins, the S proteins, which are pretty typical in terms of virus receptor binding proteins. They're trimeric, they've got fusion peptides, et cetera. So that makes a lot of sense. There are, in some of these viruses, a so-called hemagglutinin esterase protein, also known as HE, that basically takes the role of the two proteins we talked about in entry for influenza virus, and we're going to talk about a lot more as we move on here. The hemagglutinin neuraminidase, hemagglutinin binds to sialic acid, and the neuraminidase chops that off. And so it's a binding and release mechanism all in one, but not all coronaviruses have these. Probably the most different virus that we haven't really talked about much is the so-called matrix protein, or the M protein. And this is really kind of the adapter that you have between the envelope proteins and everything that's present on the inside of your envelope. That's shown here as the gray dots. Um, it's incredibly abundant. It's probably the most abundant protein when you do coronavirus virion preps. Um, Unlike most of the membrane proteins that you have for viruses, it's got three transmembrane segments. It's really you know, tightly packaged inside the membrane. And it seems to be mediate interactions between the N protein, which is the nucleocapsid protein, and the spike protein. So it's really serving as kind of glue to hold everything together. And when we see matrix proteins, this is very often the role that they are playing. Um, there's a small envelope protein as well, which might be involved in budding, um, big question mark here um, at the end of that. So what does the S protein interact with? We mentioned this already. They're mostly peptidases. And at first people were like, okay, well this makes perfect sense. As I mentioned before, capsids are generally in a metastable state. So outside of the cell, they're really stable. Getting in, you want them to be destabilized so that the genome can be released. So 
Now, that will be one way of doing it. You bind to one of these peptidases, it could chew up some part of your capsid, that would release the genome. The confusing thing is it turns out that if you mutate a lot of these proteins so that they're not active and actually don't have this peptidase activity, they still seem to serve perfectly well as receptors. So one of these, again, one of these wonderful ideas that turned out maybe not to be quite right. Um, but again, these are proteins which, again, are pretty common on the outside of cells and will bind to would be normally some kind of protein substrate. So if you think about protein substrate binding, that's what peptidases do as well. And so here it's that, probably that binding to the protein substrate, which is important for getting that interaction. Then you have probably receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, in some cases, also you have um, fusion that happens at the plasma membrane. So it's just that binding, not in fact the protease activity, which is really important here. A number of other potential receptors here. Um, sialic acid, again, some of the viruses have these hemagglutinin proteins. Um, CCAM, which is not important. Again, it's a cell surface receptor. Most of these have been found because, give you one guess what group SARS is in? Group two. So um, this is a lot of work that's been done, again, very recently because people are very concerned about SARS and how SARS is getting inside the cell. Fusion is pretty standard. Again, plasma membrane or ER and the fusion peptides are part of that S protein. You have a conformational change, and then these things get pulled together. You get membrane fusion that takes place. So again, pretty standard process as far as that fusion is concerned. What's not standard is the genome that comes in. Uh, there's one example that I found, I think a couple of years ago. There may now be a bigger one almost 32,000 bases in length, um, one single RNA, which is pretty amazing that you can you know, have that and, and still have your genome and still be functional. Um, these are the largest positive strand, single-stranded RNA virus genomes. There aren't any negative strands that are any bigger, so actually the largest um, single-strand RNA virus genomes. They've got six to seven genes, and then somebody asked a question, I think it was you, about open reading frames in terms of these single-stranded virus genomes. This is interesting because it's got six to seven open reading frames, but they're not evenly distributed. There's one humongous open reading frame here at the five prime end of the genome, which is our classic polyprotein, but then depends on the virus six or you know, five or six different genes down here at the three prime end, which are all then different open reading frames that are coding for different proteins. So that's one thing which is obviously very different about these genomes. The structures, again, not unlike any of these other positive strand, single stranded RNA viruses, they're going to function in the cytoplasm. This one has a cap and a poly A tail. So sort of a combination of the flaviviruses and the picoRNA viruses. Remember, picoRNA viruses have a protein at this end and a poly A tail at that end. The flaviviruses have a cap here and a hairpin down at that end. So this just really looks very much like a cellular messenger RNA. So it's really easy to think about um, how this would be getting translated, at least at an obvious sense. Uh, first thing that happens, you get a polyprotein which is made. But what's interesting is this polyprotein is in two separate open reading frames. And this is true for all of the coronaviruses. So there's presumably selection for that. We'll talk about that in just a second. So the first part, and some people call it 1A, I'm just going to call it the first part of this gene, encodes most of the protease enzymes, which you remember are really important for chopping up these polyproteins. The second half encodes most of the enzymatic activity that you need to replicate the genome. So why split it up like this? You know, why not have all of this in one big open reading frame? And the reason for that is probably that these guys you need a lot less of than you need of these proteins over here. So proteases you appear to near, need more of than you do of your replicases. And the fact that this is a frame shift right here in between the two means that 
you only get a lot less of these proteins than you do of those proteins. And if you think about what takes a huge amount of energy inside the cell, it's really translation and the ribosome. So running through the ribosome, so you need way less of these proteins than you do of these. It turns out that it's only about 40%, so it's not you know, that big a deal. We'll get to these structural proteins in just a second. But let's look at some of these non-structural proteins right here. Again, I've circled the ones that I think are important as far as this is concerned. Mostly these are your proteases and your polymerases. So the proteases, these are all your non-structural proteins or NSPs. Again, I didn't make up the terminology. It's not my fault, really. Um, so non-structural proteins, also you see NS a lot of the time. NSP is what people see in coronaviruses. But we already talked about the NSs and the flaviviruses last time. Same thing, non-structural proteins. These are almost always going to be your enzymes. Really important enzymes here are the proteases. In the case of the coronaviruses, you've got multiple different proteases, but basically still doing the same thing. So chopping up that viral polyprotein into the individual pieces that you need. These genomes have poly A tails and five prime caps. They're replicating the cytoplasm. Where do they get the caps and tails from? It's all viral proteins that do that. So they're viral proteins for giving you your you know, regular RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but also genome unwinding, and particularly 14, 15, and 16, which are the capping and tailing enzymes. One other thing, which is, you know, I should have updated this table. It's from a previous version of the textbook. But NS14 or NSP14 is probably also involved in proofreading activity. And this is a, a big change that happened, you know, literally in the last couple of years, and particularly because of looking at coronaviruses from the SARS point of view, is that there is proofreading activity that takes place. It's not in the polymerase itself but it's a separate enzyme that seems to be involved in proofreading. So if there is a mismatch when you're making your negative strand from your positive strand or your positive strand from your negative strand, there's an exonuclease that come, can come in and take out that incorrect base. Yeah? Yeah, number 14, NSP14, seems to be the um, critical endonuclease for proofreading. Um, so, and again, it's a 3' prime to um, 5' prime exonuclease. So it's what you would have in extra domains of your proofreading DNA polymerases, et cetera. So um, these are those non-structural proteins. We'll talk about the structural proteins and how you get them um, a little bit later on. Key here is, again, our proteases, but how do we get this frame shift taking place? Well, the way that frame shifts happen in this case, there are a couple of different ways that you can get them. But in all of the coronaviruses, it's due to this pseudonaut structure, one which you can see up at the top here. This is just an RNA secondary structure which forms due to sequences which are right here, right at this overlap between these two open reading frames. And the presence of a pseudonaut seems to either cause the ribosome to completely dissociate, which happens 60% of the time here, so you end up with this polyprotein just through gene 11 in the mouse hepatitis virus. Um, that's not critical. But then about 40% of the time, the ribosome will switch reading frames and continue. And then what this makes, in fact, is a fusion protein. So the ribosome is still continuing. It's still making peptides. Um, and that fusion protein now includes the polymerase helicase, um, exonucleases, et cetera. So this is, you know, you're asking about um, gene 14. That's this one here, which is also labeled as XON when, okay, if you're working in mouse hepatitis virus, it's known as XON. But you know, other people just call it NSP14. So, um, but that's the one which seems to be important for the proofreading activity. So those are non-structural proteins. Where do you get replication taking place? Very similar to what's happening with our picoRNA viruses and our flaviviruses. It's all at vesicles. How do you get vesicles? may have to do with autophagy, which is um, cellular cannibalism or self-cannibalism, where you're breaking down your own cell, may be stimulated in a number of different cases. We have uh, coronavirus infection, 
you get only about 1 to 2 percent of negative strand versus positive strand. Not entirely clear how that selection takes place. Uh, and we really don't know that much about the replication of these genomes. They don't obviously have those kinds of secondary structures which have been really well studied for poliovirus and all of the picoRNA viruses, but that's probably because not that many people have been working um, in these systems. So I think we're going to get a lot more information in the next couple of years about this. <clears throat> the other thing which was found um, in terms of replication, which is really quite different relative to the other viruses we've talked about so far, is that Recombination takes place a lot when these genomes are being replicated. And you remember, there are up to 30,000 bases in length. If you think about RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, they make a lot of mistakes. And if you have lots of mistakes, and these happen to be in proteins that are important for function, then we're going to have problems in terms of maintaining these coronaviruses as still replicative forms for long periods of time. On the other hand, if your polymerase can jump from one template to another template, maybe it will be able to pick, avoid some of the changes that you've had through replication that's taken place. So if you say you have a mutation in one part of the genome, no mutation in the other part of the genome on different strands that you're replicating, this um, one won't have a mutation, that one will. Again, if you think about meiotic recombination, this is a classic way that you can deal with, maybe one of the reasons we have sex and sexual reproduction, and so you can recombine and get rid of some of these deleterious mutations. Here, it just seems to be the polymerase moving from one strand to the other strand. And at first it's like, okay, well, this doesn't really make sense, but if you think about how you get all of these subgenomic RNAs that we haven't talked about yet, now it probably makes a lot more sense. So if you look at all these genes that we've ignored for the time being, the structural protein genes, they're all down here at the three prime end of the genome, which is kind of strange because, okay, you know, we just said we made the most of these proteins, a little less of these proteins, but what proteins do we need the most of? I mean, they're structural proteins. So how do you go about getting lots and lots of structural proteins? Well, if you just purify RNAs from coronavirus-infected cells, you find a ton of RNAs for all of these genes down here at the extreme three prime end of the genome. When people sequenced those genes, what they found was really kind of strange, and that was that the five prime end of all of these RNAs that were purified again from infected cells didn't actually match the sequence here in the genome. They matched the sequence over here at the five prime end of the genome. So what seems to have happened is that this piece, this sequence here, somehow hopped over and was being used for the beginnings of, not surprisingly, translation of all of these genes that are all of your structural genes. So how is this happening? Well, probably how it's happening is here on this slide. So this is a cartoon of, first, genome replication up at the top, but the um, second one is how we're getting all of our subgenomic messenger RNAs. So these are subgenomic messenger RNAs down here on the lower right. They all have this five prime sequence, which is identical to the five prime sequence of the whole genome. And then shorter and shorter pieces here, which are encoding the various structural proteins that you have down here at the end of the genome. So how do we think, and there's actually really some quite good data on how this is happening. You have your full-length genome RNA, again, up to about 30,000 bases in length. Then you have your replicase, your RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, that starts making the negative strand. It's always going to start at the 3' prime end because all polymerases are going from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So it starts at this 3' prime end of the genome, then it gets to one of these TRS sequences, I wouldn't remember the name, I wouldn't remember the sequence, but it's a place where the RNA polymerase stalls and then looks for template, looks for the next place to go. In some cases, it's going to keep going. In other cases, however, it's going to jump over to the five prime end of the genome and just copy this last little bit. And what that means is you're going to end up with a set 
of negative strands here in the, <coughs> excuse me, brown, all of which have the same sequence at their three prime ends, because that's the complement of the five prime end of the genome, and then various different sequences at their five prime end. Now, this can serve as a template for the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which will make positive strand RNAs here for each of these different pieces. And then each time that the RNA polymerase gets to one of these pause recombine sequences, it can jump or come back in the opposite direction. So what that means is you end up with lots more of these subgenomic messenger RNAs than you do of your negative strand for the whole genome, which of course makes sense because you need a whole bunch more of these messenger RNAs because you need a lot more of the structural proteins. These are also called nested subgenomic RNAs because this RNA down here at the bottom has everything in this previous one, slightly larger, slightly larger, slightly larger, slightly larger, but all of these are still have that same five prime end, which will end up being the same three prime end that they have in the final messenger RNA. So is this clear, not clear? Um, this is really the crucial concept as far as these coronaviruses are concerned. You know, how you get this recombination. And also this makes sense in terms of thinking about recombination in genome replication because whenever this polymerase stops and jumps to the other end, it could presumably be jumping to a different template as well. And so that's how that recombination could be taking place, a sexual recombination that allows you to deal with the relatively low fidelity i.e. lots of mistakes that get made by these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Okay, happy, good, wonderful, yay. Okay, so <clears throat> let's um, talk about packaging again. Packaging is very similar to what happens with the flaviviruses. You have your genome gets put together. It then buds into the ER, although in this case the ER Golgi intermediate compartment. Those of you who are taking cell biology probably know more about this than I do. Um, but basically, um, as part of the ER and Golgi process, this then becomes a secretory vesicle and released to the plasma membrane. But again, very similar to the process which is happening with the flaviviruses that we talked about last time. So I don't want to spend too much more time on this. A um, couple of things at the end that I wanted to talk about. <clears throat> One of these is how do you study these viruses? Um, this is a really, I think, elegant way to study a lot of these viruses. It takes advantage of the fact that we are positive strand RNA viruses. All you need to do is take that RNA, put it into a cell, you get virus. So they're relatively easy to study that way. The problem is, as you've got this ginormous genome, up to 30,000 bases in length. So how do you go about doing molecular genetics, i.e. making very specific changes in one part of the genome, and then seeing what happens once you've done that. So this is the so-called reverse genetics mechanism that's used to do that. You have multiple different DNAs here, which are complementary to the RNA that you started with, all different genes, all different parts of the genome. Then in just one of these different, usually plasmids, you can make a point mutation. Then you put all of these different pieces together just by cutting them with your favorite restriction endonuclease. Those will bind to each other. There are newer techniques for putting these things together, but in this case, it's using restriction endonucleases. Different restriction endonucleases, you end up with one big piece of DNA. You put in our friend T7 RNA polymerase it will transcribe this whole cDNA with your change in it. Now you can take this RNA, put it into cells, and now you've got a virus that has a mutation in one piece of your genome. So this has been really useful, not so much for SARS, um, but very much for, so for mouse hepatitis virus and some of the model coronaviruses in terms of understanding
how individual genes, individual sequences make a difference in terms of how the virus functions. And if you go back and look at the chapter in your textbook, um, because you've all read it already, uh, you'll see that they talk about individual mutations that get rid of individual proteins, et cetera. And a lot of that has been done through these um, techniques and how all of that is, has taken place. Okay, and this process is also used for other viruses, but the, the fact this is a really big one makes it a little bit uh, of a challenge. So again, we've talked a little bit about the origin, structures, finding an entry. Big deal is these nested subgenomic RNAs. Translation, the big deal here is the frame shifting that's taking place. And then <clears throat> um, translation and release. So in the last 10, 15 minutes or so, I wanted to talk about our newest coronavirus outbreak. This is the MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. Um, as of January of this year, 180 cases, 77 of them fatal. So it's a pretty high fatality rate. Um, first found in June of 2012, um, probably you know, the, the first cases that people knew about. Um, the so-called index case, and index case is where people you know, knew that it was a particular virus, able to identify a disease, um, show that that person had that disease probably caused by that exact virus. Um, the virus is isolated at Erasmus Medical Center. We'll talk about Erasmus Medical Center when we talk about influenza virus later on. These are the guys who um, did a lot of work with the highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses and transferrin ferrets, et cetera. Um, the complete sequence is published in November, so between the index case and the complete sequence, again, just a couple of months, quite closely related to bat coronaviruses, and the receptor was a, another one of these peptidase um, proteins. So this was, you know, really, again, kind of scary because a lot of people are dying from this disease, but you know, 180 cases total that we know about. Um, as of January 2014, but we can now take a look at what our friends at CNN had to say. The death toll has climbed to nine. Okay, let's screen up a little bit here. Yeah, sure. Um, it's probably just that secretion process. And when you, talk, when you think about a helix, it's not a really rigid helix. It's really quite flexible. And so it's probably that flexible helix which, which makes a big difference um, as far as is concerned. Now, I'm going to quickly change things a little bit here. Um, I Hopefully, you'll be able to listen to it. Let's see. So I noticed that whenever I've showed videos before, they haven't come up on the recording. So I'm going to try and take care of that now. Let's see. So we'll stop the recording right now. Vicious virus. Yeah. 
was the beginning call it a SARS like virus here, and that, that doesn't sound good, so talk it down here. <laughs> <laughs> People should not freak out. That's what they, again, thought a couple of years ago. Uh, much more recently, there was a nice study that was published in MBIO, which is the online open access version that ASM publishes. They did a really nice study on camels because the person who got the very first you know, really confirmed case of MERS had four pet camels. Pet camel seems like an odd thing, but apparently it's really quite common in Saudi Arabia. Um, so what they did is they went to Saudi Arabia and screened hundreds of camels to see what they had in terms of this disease. And it turns out that they had samples from more than 20 years ago that were positive for a virus that immunologically looked like MERS, and it turns out the sequence was identical to the human sequence. So almost definitely the people who are getting these MERS infections are getting them from the camels, although they had a really nice discussion, which is down here at the bottom, the, uh, the TWIV. Uh, anybody listening to TWIV this week in virology? Um, Really totally cool stuff, but they had a nice you know, half hour segment where they talked to the people who wrote this paper, um, where they said well, it's certainly possible that in fact some of the camels got the disease from the humans, which you don't necessarily know. So, but it's clearly been around for multiple decades in camels, probably also in humans, because if you look at the number of different introductions, and again, you do those phylogenetic trees, like we showed before for SARS, you see that there's multiple different versions of this MERS, each of them really quite different from one another, which is not what you expect if this is spreading from human to human. So probably it's multiple introductions from the camel population into people, um, and then not really spreading very far. Um, so. It's clearly there. Here's the paper. Um, and then the <clears throat> um, TWIV where they talk about it, the link is down here. And just to finish up on a somewhat lighter note, any of you heard the Survivor rap? 